Okay, so hello, my name is Tomas Wondra. I do work for uh, Second Quadrant and I'm Postgres contributor, developer and uh, a committer. And I'm here to talk about a feature uh, that I have contributed back to Postgres 10. Um, and my, my goal is to kind of explain why I think we need this feature, how it can help you uh, with solving uh, query planning issues and uh, how to use that. Right. The feature is called Create Statistics, which is a command that allows you to create additional statistics for the optimizer. Uh, the agenda of this call is pretty simple. Uh, at the beginning, I will briefly explain how the database, uh, how Postgres uses uh, estimates of row cardinalities um, for planning purposes, to select the, the most efficient plan to execute a given query. Right? Uh, we will then see how the presence of correlated columns in the data uh, can easily break this, right? B because the database will end up with incorrect estimates, which will result in poor choices of execution plans. And we will see how, how create statistics can be used to actually fix at least some of those issues, right? Uh, we will quickly go, go through the three statistics types that we have available in Postgres uh, 12, and that's functional dependencies and distinct coefficients and uh, most common value lists. And at the big, uh, at the end of the talk, uh, I will briefly discuss like what are the plans for the future, uh, what might be added, uh, what possible enhancements are there, right? So um, during this talk, I will use a very simple table to uh, demonstrate the issues. And that's a table of zip codes. Uh, I will use data set from United Kingdom, from Great, from Great Britain. Uh, but um, I do think it's a data set which is um, understandable for most countries. Um, you simply have like a zip code mapped to different regions of different size. Um, in this case, we have a postal code, and then we have a place name, state, county, and community, right? Uh, this is a data set which contains a lot of uh, redundancy, correlation between the columns, uh, and we will see uh, how it actually breaks the, uh, exec um, the query planning in Postgres. The data set has, uh, that you can download at the link um, at the bottom of the slide, it only has like 27,000 rows, um, which is not really sufficient to show all the issues. So I have inserted the data repeatedly until I got a table with like 1.7 million rows. Right? So you could see this as a, uh, something like a, a fact table in the data warehouse, right? where you have a lot of redundancy um, between the rows. Okay, so that's an example, but why do we actually care about all of this? Well, you can imagine the, the query planning in, in the database as a two-step process. Like in the first step, the database, um, the database estimates the sizes of, of results for individual operations in the query. So for example, um, how many rows will match a condition in a where clause? How many rows will be produced by a join? And, and so on, right? So that's the first step. And then based on this information, the database will pick the most efficient query plan um, with, with the lowest cost, which is expected to run the fastest, which is what the users want, right? Um, so it will for small fractions of the table, it will pick a, an index scan. For large fra fractions of a table, it will pick a sequential scan, and so on. Right? That's why these estimates are important. And uh, I will not talk about the path selection process at all, 
The important thing here is that if you don't have sufficiently accurate information from the first step, from the cardinality estimation, if there are significant uh, misestimations, then the second phase simply can't make a good decision, right, in a lot of cases. It will end up picking a plan which works pretty poorly for the actual number of rows. So, um, I will give you some examples later, right? So, I will focus on the first part, but it's like an important step for the second one. So, I do expect that you kind of know what explain is. Explain is a command which shows uh, the execution plan of a query, and if you do explain analyze, it will actually run the query and show you both the estimates and the actual number of rows. We don't care about timings here, uh, that's uh, irrelevant. What we care about is the estimate of number of rows and the actual number of rows. So in this case, for a very simple query which only has a condition on a column name place name, the database estimated that there are like 14,028 rows and then uh, after running the query uh, it counted that there are 13,889 rows which is pretty damn close to the estimate, right? It's like uh, less than 1% estimation error which is really nice. Uh, now, how does the database actually end up with these estimates? Like, where does the 14,000 come from? Well, the database actually collects and maintains a, a bunch of statistics about the data. First, it has a table level statistic, uh, which is number of rows and number of pages, right? Um, number of 8 kilobyte chunks on disk. Um, what we care here what we care about here is the number of page, uh, number of tuples, number of rows, which for this table you can find in the PG class catalog, which is the main catalog in Postgres, and uh, in the rel tuples that's the number of uh, rows in the table. It's like an estimate, but it's usually very very close to the actual value. So in this case you can see it's like 1.7 million rows. Um, so that's the total number of rows in the table. But how do you know what fraction of those rows matches a condition? Well, um, that's the second part of the statistics uh, Postgres actually maintains, and that's um, uh, for each column we have uh, some approximation of data distribution. We have information like number of distinct values in, in the column, we have uh, information about uh, uh, about uh, num a fraction of null values, uh, and then we have some approximation of distribution functions, which is like uh, most common value list and histograms, right? Um, for these discrete uh, data, like names of places and so on, um, the more important, more useful bit is the number of uh, is the most common value list which you can see in the system catalog called PG stats, which is like a human readable view of the data. And uh, the most common value list there is encoded in two columns. First one is the most common vals, that's the values uh, in the column. And most common frequencies, that's the frequencies of each value, right? Uh, so for example, we know that London has roughly 10% of the data in the table. Like 10% of the rows has a value London in this column. Then it's like uh, Birmingham with like 1.2%, Glasgow with like 0.9% and so on. And finally we find that Manchester, which is the value that we have used in the query, has like 0.8%. And the database combines this with the total number of rows, which it knows from the PG class, and it multiplies that together, uh, which gives us the, the actual estimate, right? It's the 
uh, 1.7 multiplied by 0 0.8 percent is uh, 14,027 and uh, uh, 0 0.99999, which rounded up is uh, uh, 14,028, which is exactly the estimate we got in the execution plan, right? So that's very simple. We could do the same thing for a different column, and the process of computing the estimate would be exactly the same, right? You would have the number of rows multiplied by uh, uh, the frequency of, of the value in the most common value list for the other column, which in this case is, um, gives us like estimate of 13,858. Great. Again, um, if you compare that to the actual number of rows, which is like 13,912, um, that's pretty close. That's pretty accurate. Now, what happens if we actually have a, a query with both conditions at the same time, right? So, if we have a place name and community name both restricted to be Manchester, the database suddenly ends up with an estimate of 115 when uh, in reality there are like 12,000 rows, right? So suddenly uh, we, have, um, we have an estimate which is two orders of magnitude off from the actual value. And at this point the database might make a, a poor choice of picking, say, index scan versus uh, a bitmap heap scan or something like that, right? Um, but how did actually the database uh, end up with such uh, low value? Well, we kind of understand that all the community names uh, and place names with Manchester are correlated, right? It's probably um, difficult to find a, a place uh, which is called Manchester in London, or something like that, right? Um, that doesn't happen very often. Unfortunately, the database doesn't understand that, right? It only has the per column statistics, and then it applies the principle that uh, you can simply split the conditions, compute the selectivities independently, and then multiply them to get the selectivity of the actual, uh, of, of the whole um, condition, right? Because selectivity um, is essentially just a probability that a, a row matches the condition, right? So it, it behaves like a, like a probability. Well, so, right. so uh, for this particular query, what the database does, um, it has the probability for both conditions at the same time. It splits that into the probabilities, a product of probabilities for each condition independently, which in this case means like 0.8% multiplied by 0.8%, which gives us a very low number. And if you multiply that with the number of rows, you end up with just uh, 115, which is the estimate we have seen in the execution plan, which is pretty, pretty low. So that's this, right? That's the underestimate. Um, but we can also see uh, estimation errors in the opposite direction, right? We can easily get uh, conditions that are naturally uh, mutually exclusive, right? So for example, we can say, give me all uh, rows with community name Westminster where place name is not London. And we kind of know that there are very few such rows but the database doesn't understand that. So it just computes the selectivities for each condition, multiplies that together, and it ends up with like 11,000 rows estimated. When in practice, there are only four rows, which may be due to you know, historical reasons or something like that. 
and uh, um, so that's an overestimate. All these issues are uh, caused by something we call correlated clumps, and due to using uh, something we call attribute value independence assumption, which essentially means we assume that the that the columns are not um, statistically dependent uh, because that allows us to do very simple estimation of uh, multi-column uh, multi conditions, right? It can result in both underestimations and overestimations and uh, the consequence of that in the second phase, in the path selection uh, phase, uh, is both uh, uh, poor scan choices and poor joint choices. What I mean by that? Uh, let's assume that we have a table um, with, um, say, uh, tens of millions of rows. And uh, we have a condition which the database expects uh, to, to match only like 90 rows. In that case, the database will probably pick an index scan on that condition, if there is an index, of course. But then if you, uh, if the database at execution, uh, while executing the query, finds that uh, there are like 12 million rows, suddenly the index scan is probably not very efficient, right? It will mean a lot of random I.O. against the table. And maybe a sequential scan or just a bitmap index scan would be much more efficient. So that's one possibility. The, but we can do a, an error in the opposite direction, right? So the database may believe that there are like 12 million rows, ends up selecting a sequential scan, when in practice there are only 90 rows, and the index scan would be much, uh, much cheaper. This, of course, can lead to issues at uh, uh, when planning joins, because we may end up with um, a join algorithm which is not very efficient for the number of rows. So, for example, we can make this, you know, planning error uh, at the scan level, and we may end up with, say, index scan instead of a sequential scan. But in the next step, it means that we will probably pick a nested loop because for 90 rows, a nested loop is very efficient, right? It will just do 90 lookups in a table and that's it. But then if you find like 12 million rows, suddenly you need to do 12 million index scans on the inner relation, which is again going to make a lot of uh, random IO, which is not very good. What's worse, this can this usually leads to like a, a cascade of nested loops, and if you see a query like this with this sort of um, uh, of underestimates, it probably means the query will never complete, right? So this is really really dangerous, and uh, in Postgres for a long time we only had very crude uh, options to to actually tune this. What we could have done is, for example, you could disable the nested loop entirely, affecting the whole query, uh, and we didn't actually have any insight um, into the data. Or you could maybe uh, change the random page cost and, uh, uh, and so on, and maybe some other cost parameters to kind of convince the database, uh, maybe trick it into using a different execution plan. But it was it was more a workaround than a solution because it didn't actually fix the estimates, right? So that's where the uh, extended statistics, where the command create statistics uh, helps. Uh, it was introduced in Postgres 10 with two very simple types of statistics. That's functional dependencies and uh, end distinct coefficients. Um, and then uh, in Postgres 12, we have added an additional uh, type of statistic, which is called most common value lists. So, what are functional dependencies about? Well, if you have ever done uh, normalization of the schema, like 
uh, refactoring the, the schema to, to meet the conditions of normal forms, uh, you probably know what the function dependency is. It says that um, if you know the value in column A, it also uh, determines uh, a value in column B, right? Um, functional dependencies uh, in this sense are pretty simple. Uh, so for example, a zip code, uh, once you know the zip code, you already know all the other columns. Essentially, the zip code works as a sort of uh, uh, primary key, right, for the table. But um, we have also other dependencies here. So for example, uh, once you know the place, you probably also know the community. Um, once you know the community, you also know the county, uh, and so on, right? The, the relationship is, is kind of transitive. So um, once you know the place, you also know the county. And this is exactly what we are looking for here, right? So if you want to create functional dependencies and collect functional dependencies on the, uh, on the table, what you need to do is you need to use a create statistics command. The syn syntax may look a bit weird. Um, you specify the name of the statistic, um, then you specify the types of statistics that you want to build. In this case, dependencies means functional dependencies. Then you specify the columns that uh, should be included in the statistics and the name of the table. So in this case, we want to build the functional dependencies on columns place name and community name from the table zip codes. Um, the numbers two and five, those are simply attribute numbers uh, for those columns. So place name is the second column in the table, community name is the fifth column in the table, and uh, that's what will be encoded in the statistics. Because the names may change, but the, the attribute numbers uh, are constant. The, the create statistics just defines the statistic object. It doesn't actually build it, right? It says, I want functional dependencies for these columns, but the statistic is actually built uh, um, during the analyze command. So it will, when you run the analyze, it will actually build the usual statistics for individual columns and also the statistics defined by the create statistics. Then you can actually inspect the statistics. You can, you can look at the contents of the statistics and uh, 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 you can see that there is like a um, five is functionally dependent on two with and there is a, a value assigned to this functional dependency. The value in this case is like 0 0.697633 is uh, uh, what we call a strength or a degree of the functional dependency. Essentially what we want to do is um, when the strength is zero, we want to just compute the old school um, selectivity as a product, right, of the selectivities, because there is no dependency, no functional relationship between the columns. When it's one, we do want to ignore the second condition entirely. So we will only use uh, the condition on the place name. And when it's somewhere in between, we want to kind of um, use something like a linear approximation uh, smooth transition from one to the other. So um, that's what this formula actually does. I, I do think you need to uh, focus on it too much. Uh, the whole point of uh, this formula uh, is that when this, the degree is zero, we want to compute the product, right? It's like uh, selectivity for the first condition multiplied by selectivity for the second condition. When it's one, we do want to ignore the second condition entirely and just use the selectivity for the first one. Unfortunately, real data sets 
are not perfect, right? They are, uh, for example, in the data set of zip codes, there are definitely um, rows that contradict this for historical reasons, or maybe there are data entry issues, or uh, maybe there are like uh, places with the same name in different regions, right? Or something like that. So we want to handle this gracefully. We don't want uh, a sudden switch from one uh, behavior to the other behavior uh, just because we sample slightly different subset of rows, right? Where maybe the contradicting row is in the old sample, is not in the new sample. Because that would uh, cause pretty significant changes to query plans. And if you apply this, this formula to the numbers we have seen, you end up with an estimate of like uh, 9200. Right, 9,281, which in the execution plan, well, th there is slightly different estimate, but that doesn't matter. Um, it, it's much closer to the roughly 12,000 rows, uh, which is the actual number. So the functional dependencies in this case actually helped quite a lot. Right. Unfortunately, um, it's not perfect. It's a very simple type of statistics. We have used that mostly to implement the infrastructure for extended, extended statistics in general. So um, if you look at the overestimate with uh, inequality conditions, we actually don't handle functional dependencies. We don't apply functional dependencies to this at all because functional dependencies only work for equality conditions. Right, so uh, this is just the old estimate. Right, didn't change at all. The other issue is that functional dependencies don't actually store any information about the values. It only tracks like a relationship between the columns in general, but it doesn't say which values are compatible with what. So, for example. Uh, when we have um, a condition place name is Manchester and county name is Westminster, we do know that it's probably like no rows at all. But the database doesn't understand that. It just knows that um, those columns are functionally dependent and that's it. Which means that we end up with uh, 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 more than 9,000 rows in the estimate, but no rows at execution. Um, the reason for uh, for this is, uh, as I said, that the functional dependencies don't store the actual values. Uh, what needs to happen is that the application needs to respect this uh, relationship, ne needs to respect this condition. So if you have an application that, for example, um, imagine a, a web application uh, which uh, first offers you uh, uh, a list of states and then based on which state you pick it will offer you like a list of counties from only that state and then you use these values selected in those uh, lists to build the actual query in a search for example that will work perfectly fine with functional dependencies because the way the queries are generated uh, it ensures that the values are compatible but if you have uh, like randomly constructed uh, queries, uh, that will not work uh, that well. Okay, so those were functional dependencies. Now I'd like to briefly talk about um, end distinct coefficients, which is the second type of statistics introduced in Postgres 10. And uh, functional dependencies were about improving estimates for where conditions. And distinct coefficients are uh, meant to improve uh, estimates for group by clauses, like aggregations, like number of groups in a query. So, for example, let's say you have a very simple query from the zip codes table, which says group by community name. And what we want is uh, the query will tell us it's a hash aggregation, 
and we expect the query or the database expects the query to to produce roughly uh, 358 groups, right? Uh, because there are this number of distinct values in the column, or the database thinks that. Then, at execution time, uh, the database actually ends up with uh, 359 rows, 359 groups in in the result, which is pretty close. I mean, like, it's less than 1% difference. So, how does the database actually uh, compute this estimate? Well, again, we look into the PG Stats catalog, which stores the per column uh, statistics, and there is a, a, a column which is called Ndistinct, which is the estimated number of distinct values for that column, which for the community name here is 358. Right? And that's exactly what we got in the execution plan. Now, what happens if you do uh, a group by with multiple columns? So, for example, group by community name and place name. Well, suddenly we are not that uh, accurate, right? The database in this case uh, believes that there are like uh, 169,000 rows groups in those two columns, but at execution time it only finds uh, like 15,000. So we are like all the of magnitude uh, higher uh, than the actual value. In this case, it has like the the bad consequence that the database switches to a group aggregation with uh, a sort, right? So, in this case, it, uh, it just uh, realized that with uh, 170,000 groups, uh, it can't do the hash aggregation in, in memory and switches to a sort aggregation. So, which requires a sort on large data set that may be quite expensive um, if you actually need to do the sort, and uh, you can see that the query actually took um, more than 1.5 second. So, how did we actually end up with the the estimate of 170,000 rows? Well, it's the same problem as before. The database, if it has two columns, it assumes those columns are independent, and if you have two independent columns, you can simply compute the number of groups as um, uh, a product of number of groups in each column. So in this case, we have the number of groups in the community name as 358, and for the other column, it's more than 12,000. If you multiply that together, um, uh, it's like 4.4 million uh, combinations, which obviously is way too high because the group, uh, the the whole table only has li like 1.7 million rows. So that's um, obviously an overestimate. But we also apply uh, another heuristics, uh, which says that we only produce up to 10% of rows of the table, which in this case is exactly the 1.7, uh, 170,000 rows um, that we have seen in the execution plan, right? So that's how we end up with the uh, with the estimate. But we can actually fix that. We can instruct the database to collect the indistinct estimate, not just for individual columns, but also for combinations of columns, and. Uh, uh, you can use the same command create statistics with just a different name, oh, sorry, different type of the statistics, which in this case is indistinct, and uh, then analyze will build the the extended statistics uh, for each possible combination of this, those columns. So if you look into the PG Stats X uh, catalog, you can see that there are like combinations two and four, two and five, four five 
and then for all three columns together. And uh, what we had was uh, place name and community name, which is 2 and 5, and the estimate for that is 13,221, which is great, because that gives us much closer estimate to the actual value. And it allows the database to switch back to the hash aggregation, which uh, uh, is much faster than the group-based aggregation, than the sort-based aggregation, uh, by a factor of three, right? Because the group aggregate took 1.5 second. This is only for 400 milliseconds. So that's nice, right? It's a very nice improvement. The, the old and distinct behavior uh, was intentionally defensive, right? We wanted to, we were okay to overestimate the values a bit, even if it meant slightly slower uh, execution or a risk of slightly slower execution than hash aggregate. Because up to Postgres 13, well, up to Postgres 12, the hash aggregate uh, didn't spill to disk. Right. which meant that if you underestimated the number of rows significantly, you may end up with out-of-memory error, right? Because uh, hash aggregation has to keep all the, uh, all the data in memory. It wasn't able to switch back to, uh, to uh, uh, the group aggregation or something, and um, that was kind of risky. The end distinct coefficients actually make this much more reliable, right? They allow us to make better estimates, which reduces the number, uh, reduces the danger of out of memory issues, and uh, it's very useful for large data sets. Okay, and finally, the third uh, type of statistics, which is the most common value lists, which is introduced in Postgres 12. Um, and uh, you can understand that it's, uh, you probably expect that it's um, um, an extension of the per column most common value list, right? It's just for multiple columns. Um, until now, we have seen three types of estimation issues, right? We have seen underestimation, which was fixed by the uh, functional dependencies, and then we have seen two types of overestimations, um, which haven't been fixed by uh, functional dependencies. Uh, the the end distinct coefficients are kind of irrelevant here because those are about group by. We only talk about uh, where conditions here. So, how does the most common value list actually help with some of those cases? Well, uh, first, how do you actually create the most common value list? Uh, using the create stats uh, create statistics command, right? You just specify the, the, the columns and we will build the list. Except that f instead of having just a value a, s a value for a single column in the in the list, we will have combinations of values. So if you do this and if you look into the PG stats uh, EXT system catalog, then you will see for example that the combination of London and Greater London has 10% of the table. The combina uh, combination of Birmingham and West Midlands has 1.2% of the table, and so on. So instead of uh, uh, a single, single column, there are combinations of columns. And how does it actually help with the, uh, with the issues uh, uh, we have seen? Well, the underestimate uh, without any statistics looks like this. It has, there's like uh, 18,000 versus uh, 170,000, right, 74,000. So it's like all the of magnitude of. If you use the functional dependencies, uh, it gets much closer. It's like uh, 133,000 versus 174,000. So much better. And if you use the most common value lists, it gets exact, right? It's um, um, 
um, spot on because the functional dependence, uh, sorry, the most common value list uh, is very accurate and this is the largest group. So it definitely is in the list, right? The other issue, which is the overestimate uh, with inequality conditions. Well, you can see that it's like two orders of magnitude higher than the actual value, right? Uh, functional dependencies can't actually help here because this is inequality condition and functional dependencies are not compatible with that. So uh, for functional dependencies, that's the same issue. The most common value list here is uh, improving the estimate, but it's not as good as, as before. It's roughly, um, you know, three times or f sorry, five times better than the old value. Uh, the reason is that the most common value list uh, can't really include all possible values in this case, right? So there is a, like a, a, a group of r groups, sorry, group of rows, which is not perfectly represented by the functional, uh, by the most common value list. Right. The overestimate tool, uh, which is like equality with uh, different uh, uh, mismatching values. Uh, well, um, with those statistics, it's like 8,000 versus, or 7,000 versus zero. Um, dependencies actually make it much worse because uh, we will just ignore uh, one of the conditions to some degree, right? So that's actually the problem. And with most common value lists, uh, it will actually get back to the original value. Again, we know that these values are incompatible, so they are guaranteed not to be in the list. And in this case, the, there are so many combinations of values that the list uh, will never be perfect, right? It will never cover 100% of the table. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so I hope I have actually uh, convinced you that um, this is a useful feature. Uh, there's definitely uh, things uh, that we need to improve in the future. Uh, I do hope that you understand where the estimation errors, at least some of them, come from. And uh, what are the possible future improvements? First, we may add additional types of statistics, right? Uh, so, for example, we may add multidimensional histograms. Uh, that's something that was already proposed um, uh, in Postgres 12, Postgres 10, but we haven't actually committed that. Um, maybe we, uh, we will invent some new types of statistics. Um, I'm not sure. What I definitely want to add in Postgres 14 um, and what I plan to work on is statistics on expressions because so far the create statistics command can only reference the, the columns directly, right? You can't, for example, have a function call there, which is annoying. And we actually do have a workaround for that. Uh, for individual columns, you can create a functional index and we will build um, uh, we will build um, statistics for that. But uh, it's kind of uh, overkill because then you need to maintain the index, right? Which is not cheap. It means that you will need, uh, you will need uh, disk space and so on. And finally, that's, uh, we would like to improve the joint uh, estimates because all the examples that I gave you are on scan level only, right? It's just like a select from a table. We don't know how to do, uh, how to improve join estimates at this point. So the, the syntax, which is a bit weird, is already prepared for that, but we don't actually have that implemented yet. Now with Thomas and the Q&A sessions. Take it away, Thomas. Okay, so on the IRC, I see only one question, which is like, why don't we build uh, 
statistics on all or nearly all combinations of columns? And the answer to that is very simple. It's overhead, right? Uh, it means that um, the analyze would need to collect a lot of additional stuff, which means the analyze itself would take longer. Uh, the uh, the statistics would need additional disk space, although maybe that not, that's not a huge issue. And uh, finally, it also means overhead for the query planning, right? Because uh, when we are building the query plans, we need to estimate different stuff. And if you suddenly, instead of one statistics or just a handful of them, if you have maybe uh, many more, uh, that might actually uh, make the query planning slower. So we kind of require uh, the insight from the developer or DBA to actually tell us which statistics to build. It's a bit similar to say indexes, right? Because the database also doesn't automatically build all, all indexes on all columns um, or combinations of columns or whatever, um, the DBA has to actually create the explicit indexes that are useful uh, with respect to the, to the workload. And uh, also the larger the number of columns, for example, in the most common value lists are, uh, the, the larger the number of combinations of values, right? So the ultimately the, the most common value list would uh, contain just much smaller, uh, represent much smaller part of the data, right? Because if you have five columns with uh, uh, 10 values each, then that's like 10 to the power of fifth, right? Um, and if you have like many more columns, there are many more combinations. So uh, those are all things that we need to consider um, there are possible improvements in like removing the the, uh, the task of actually defining the statistic from the DBA to kind of at least advise which statistics to build, but we don't have that at this point. Yeah, I don't see any other question, I think, at this point. No, I don't see any other either. Okay, thank you. We'll add this on to the end of your talk. Yep, yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye.